Once again, we'd like to welcome you to Moving Forward with Young Voices. Hey, we are very happy to welcome a new contributor to the show this week. We have Nathaniel Ogunyi joining us from London. Nathaniel, thank you so much for being on the program. Take a moment here to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Good afternoon. Uh, so I'm a political analyst working with Young Voices, but also with a global business consultancy. My job is about connecting clients to what's going on in politics. So it's sort of giving them information, giving them analysis, giving them insight, and sort of standing back and analyzing where the opportunities are for them. Um, and that's part of that analysis uh, about the UK political scene, but about the UK's economic scene is what has gone into my piece, which I gather we'll be talking about shortly. Absolutely. Now, look, I, I'm i pretty acquainted with what's happening in the U.S. economy because, well, I pay attention every time I go to the grocery store, every time I fuel up my vehicle. <laughs> I have a pretty good sense of how things are going. I was a little bit surprised, though, to hear that uh, Britain's economy is also in, in a state of recession. Tell me a little bit about uh, about the state uh, of British, Brit- the British economy, please. So that's right. The UK economy entered into a recession at the start of this year. Um, recession is two negative quarters of GDP growth. We've had that over the last six months of the 2023. Um, we're expecting it to be a short and shallow recession. So we're expecting that the GDP figures out for the first quarter of this year will indicate that we've exited recession, that the economy is back on track, that the economy is growing. Um, that recession has also been accompanied by inflation, which has, of course has been a bit of an issue everywhere. Uh, inflation has been higher for longer than many central bankers would have wanted to. And of course, that has implications for consumers and their purchasing power, right? All of a sudden, your monthly wage doesn't go as far as it used to. And so that means you have to trim consumption in areas that you wouldn't necessarily like to. And so that's been a massive factor in affecting the UK economy. That is partially due to supply chains and post-COVID. But I think part of that in the UK economy is just due to a lack of supply. Um, the UK economy has not expanded its infrastructure in a way that we that we should have done. Um, we have not necessarily invested in many of the areas that we should, and so that's led to unnecessary uh, unnecessary inflation. But uh, the recent figures suggest that inflation is coming down. Uh, we're at three point four percent right now, uh, with forecast to hit the two percent limit, so two percent target by the second half of this year. I really appreciated in this article how you described the difference between um, leading and lagging um, indicators in in the economy. And I wonder, would you take just a moment to to explain that to our audience? Yes. So you have leading and lagging indicators, right? So we talked about inflation and GDP, but those are lagging. So it tells you what inflation was over the last three months or what it's been over the last six months, but that tells you about the past. But as economists, we're also interested in the future, right? We're also interested in what's coming up. We're also interested in what lies ahead. And so it's helpful to know what uh, the last three months have been, but we also want to know what's coming. And so forward-leaning indicators, and I talked a bit about the Purchasing Managers Index, PMI, um, which is sort of compiled by, by S&P, but the PMI sort of tell, is a leading indicator because it tells you what we should expect of the economy going forward. So the the thrust of this article is that, uh, yes, Britain's economy may be in recession, but it doesn't have to be there long term. In fact, one of the things you recommend is setting the service sector free in order to, to help grow the economy. Would you walk us through that process? Yes. Yeah, so I think setting the service sector free is about recognizing that much of the UK's economy has moved from production of, say, goods, so talking about farming or hard manufacturing of cars or goods like that. Um, much of the UK economy has moved on from that to services, right? And so when you look at, say, finance, the UK is a global leader in finance. Um, when it comes to companies listing on the stock market, even though there's been a bit of discussion about that in the UK, actually, you know, our, the London Stock Exchange is bigger than its nearest two or three uh, competitors in Europe, right? Um, when it comes to law, people often strike contracts in countries based on English law, because they understand the English legal sector, which is part of the services sector, is a big thing here. Um, equally, PR, accounting, um, other other sectors uh, within services that are big for the UK economy. And so services are a big part of the UK economy. They're 81% of our output, they're 85% of jobs, and more than half of exports. And so it's important that policymakers recognize that the service sector is important to the future growth of the UK economy. 
if we want to get our UK economy growing again, then we can't ignore the service sector. Um, it's quite easy to put on a hard hat and visit, a, say, a car factory. It's, you know, less glamorous to sort of, you know, put on a suit and go to go to a trading floor on Canary Wharf. But they're, they're, they're equally important, right? And actually, if we look at in terms of it, if we look at it in terms of output and in terms of employment, actually that trading floor on Canary Wharf is probably more more impactful than the, than the car factory, uh, say, in Sunderland. And so it's about recognising that in order to grow the UK economy, services are a big part of that. Is there resistance to uh, to turning loose the the service sector, and, and where would where would that come from? If so, so I think there is resistance to the ideas behind. So, for instance, I talk about investment. I talk about foreign investment. The UK had a summit last year. They raised twenty nine point five billion pounds from the likes of. JP Morgan, Blackstone, Goldman Sachs, all choosing to invest in the UK economy, uh, whether that's in tech or in life sciences. But there is some resistance to foreign investment, particularly in some quarters, because some people don't like the idea of UK assets being owned by foreigners. But the truth is, in a modern economy, we can't generate all the investment that we need to service it, right? We can't generate all the funds that we need to invest. And so therefore, we have to go abroad to our allies, whether that's in the United States and Australia and New Zealand. But we have to go abroad to our allies and get them to invest in our economy too. And that's an important thing. I also talk about migration, which has been a big factor here in the UK. Um, I think the government are currently trying to crack down on low scale and illegal migration. So stopping the boats is a big pleasure of the Prime Minister. He talks about stopping people from sort of smuggling uh, in the English Channel, but in our efforts to crack down on illegal migration, we shouldn't neglect high skill migration. High skill migration is really important. It's really important that we get the best people into the best jobs, right? So if you're looking, you know, if you're looking to start a life sciences firm, you're wondering where to base it. The UK is a great place because we have some of the world's best scientists, but we can't retain that position if we don't continue to let those people in. No, that makes perfect sense. And and I know right now in America, there's a great deal of focus on the southern border and, and pretty much everybody who wants to come to America unfor- unfairly gets compared to people trying to cross that southern border without permission. Um, one thing that you point out, too, in your article, though, is um, to in order to get the economy to grow, the UK is going to have to attract investment. What types of investment are, are best for, for the long term growth of the economy? So I'll point to one subsector in particular. Energy is somewhere that the UK needs a lot more investment. If you look at the cost of energy per kilowatt hour in the UK compared to France, Germany, and a few other European competitors, it's much higher. Right, and we often import energy from elsewhere, elsewhere in Europe. And so we need to get much more investment, not in just into the generation, but into the distribution of that power. And that in turn will bring down the costs for the type types of manufacturers um, that I'm talking about. And it might be surprising that I'm talking about energy costs and manufacturers in the context of services, which is, of course, what this article is about. But they are all quite closely linked together, right? Um, the service sector requires investment just as the hard manufacturing service, sorry, just as the hard manufacturing sector does too. Um, and so what, what generates the right atmosphere for investment in one does it also in the other. So who are some of the leading voices that people are looking to as far as uh, taking those necessary steps to, to grow Britain's economy, um, not just a little bit, but decisively grow it? So, of course, attention falls to the Chancellor, the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt, who is first put in place by Liz Truss, um, who was first put in place by Liz Truss in October of 2022, um, while she was trying to stuck around until now um, he just actually delivered the spring statement which was expected to be the government's penultimate fiscal statement before before the next election here but he's a he's a big part to this equation equally the business and trade secretary who's been leading lots of the uk's engagement or economic engagement with other countries so in terms of signing trade deals in terms of signing memorandums of understanding of understanding which he's done with several u.s states um in terms of trade deals uh, in cptpp which is an Indo-Pacific trade deal, which I talk about that in the article. He's, she's quite leading on that. Um, equally, the Minister for Investment, uh, Lord Dominic Johnson. I have to hand it to you, Nathaniel. You are one of the more optimistic people. In fact, you may be the most optimistic person that I've talked to in recent memory. And and that's that's probably because a lot of us, I think, have tunnel vision. Oh, we're seeing the negative parts. But um, reading your article, 
was uh, was actually quite encouraging. And it sounds like uh, there's a bright future for for the UK if you know people will recognize the opportunities that you spell out in your article. Where's the best place for people to access your work, and and where can they find you on social media? So I'm on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. Um, if you put in Nathaniel Lucini, I, I come up on Twitter. Um, I also have a muckrack page, which sort of helps me collate all my works and works that I've written, um, both in Reaction, where this piece was published, but for Conservatives Global, where I wrote a bit about the spring budget. Um, so muckrack sort of is where I collect all my writing from various sources. But yes, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on Twitter. Um, I think I'm on Twitter at Nathan Oguni rather than my full name. I think so. I'll be into my to my full name. But yes, I'm on Twitter, um, and muckrack is the best place for my articles put together. I'm also on LinkedIn. Okay, again, we're talking with Nathaniel Ogunny. Thank you so much for your time. I hope we get the chance to talk again later this year. As do I. Thank you so much. Welcome back. This is Moving Forward with Young Voices. We are happy to welcome another contributor to the show. And Shakira Jackson joins us now. Shakira, thank you so much for being part of the program today. Thank you. I'm so excited. So for for the sake of people who are meeting you for the very first time, take just a moment. Tell us about who you are and what you do. Absolutely. So I am a policy analyst and a political commentator. I also serve on a board for a nonprofit called Mental Health on Purpose. But this is kind of my own individual, you know, prospect and perspective on um, free speech. But yeah, I, I'm a do all be all. I have many professions, but I, my number one title is I consider myself to be a liberty fighter. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> well, then you are you are a kindred spirit and I, I welcome you. And, and actually, we have a great topic to discuss today uh, concerning free free speech. Now, um, talk to me a little bit about uh, the concerns regarding free speech at Georgetown University. I, I'm not a part of the Georgetown community, but I'm always interested when when institutions of higher learning are, are kind of working through these kinds of issues. Absolutely. So in my opinion, I think Georgetown University really faces challenges regarding free speech, kind of highlighted in my article um, by like a recent red rating from the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. So the code of conduct uh, for the students, particularly in the section of um, and civility has kind of uh, inversely kind of brushed over open discourse. And this has kind of led to calls for revising the code to really provide a clear definition of disrespectful behavior, um, including hate speech, things like that, that has been taking place on campus. And so uh, I really kind of break out to say, kind of to address these issues, the university could really implement like educational initiatives to promote constructive engagement with diverse perspectives. And so this could include workshops on active listening and respectful disagreements, also kind of introducing a neutral uh, free speech advocate on campus. So having some kind of event centered around that to really enforce this respectful behavior standards. But I think Georgetown University overall has has long ways to go. But by realigning policies and investing in educational initiatives and, of course, fostering a culture of open discourse, I think that's where Georgetown can kind of um, unhold its tradition of intellectual rigor and moral development while really ensuring, you know, a campus that remains a haven for free thought and respectful dialogue. All right, I have two questions for you. First of all, uh, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, if they give you a red rating, what does Mm -hmm. that denote? To, to get a red rating from them, is red a danger signal? Oh, yes. Yeah. So uh, the red rating from FIRE, which is the you know free speech for ranking, is concerning as it kind of like indicates potential challenges regarding free speech on campuses. So it highlights the importance of kind of ensuring that our university is a place where diverse perspectives are not just tolerated, but actively encouraged. So this rating really serves as a call to action, rather, for Georgetown to really reevaluate its policies and practices to ensure that they are in Line with our values of open discourse and intellectual freedom. And as a member of the Georgetown community, I believe in it's critical, you know, it is critical for us to address these issues uh, transparently and constructively. So I think because FIRE has given their ratings, um, the, the talk is now around town. So the ratings mean a lot. And, and the second question has to do with what you point out, and that is, you know, what exactly is disrespectful behavior? Boy, that sounds like an open-ended kind of thing that's open to interpretation. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, for me, it's mainly, um, you know, I think to address these challenges, Georgetown should really consider kind of like the multifaceted approach. So, um, you know, this can include a thorough review and potential revision of the code of conduct, which I was referring to earlier, as far as the definition of disrespectful behavior is concerned. So kind of like um, the, additionally, the university could invest in these, like I said, educational initiatives and um, aimed at promoting constructive engagement with different perspectives. But I think it just goes back to people not respecting other people's opinions, you know, um, especially in regards to disagreements. I think it's okay to not be on the same page about everything, but if you can't respectfully, uh, you know, disagree respectfully, that's where we kind of have this crash of um, people disagreeing. Because I mean, even with what's going on right now in Israel, um, you know, that whole thing was a, a huge example of just Georgetown really not really having that open discourse students were going back and forth and um, making pro you know protesting on campus writing things with chalk on the sidewalks so I think it's a it's a level of respect thing and it's so hard not to use the definition the word in the definition but you know it's as clear as it gets being able to disagree um, but in a respectful manner so I, I'm really really toned on that I'm really keen on that and I think that's what's going to really push us forward I'm trying to think back and and I, I can't recall exactly when we, we made this shift, but I know in American higher education, for some time, it seems like there's been a dynamic where if someone disagrees with me, they are my enemy or they consider me mm. their enemy is probably more how, how it's it's played out. Where does that kind of thinking originate? Is it, Can we find a beginning point where honest inquiry and, and, you know, meaningful discourse between varying points of view turned into that rigid, you're either with me or you're against me? You know, I hate to say this, but I blame it on the media. I really do. I blame <laughs> it on the media because for whatever reason, you know, we've developed this cancel culture thing and um, folks, you, you can't say one thing. And also as a, as a Gen Zer, I think I have my, my ticket to say this. Uh, we've become very overly sensitive as well um, in comparison to other generations. So being able to kind of hear someone's different opinion, I think it really kind of triggers uh, us in a different way. So I think just being able to have the mindset of being able to, like I said, respectfully disagree, we've kind of lost that along the way, especially with people hiding behind their screens and their computers. And yeah. you can say things online and um, people will never know maybe who you even are because you'll, you know, you'll identify, you'll bot yourself or whatever the case may be. So I, if we're looking at a real starting point, I think that that's kind of where we started to really see the shift in regards to just like things that is happening online, because, you know, I won't, I won't say any names, but there has definitely been some things that I've heard that, you know, students were, um, you know, getting messages online and um, you know there were there were comments being made in, in regards to even just like I said the Israeli the Palestinian situation so all of this stuff is just rooted in um, you know whether that be social media or even people just saying hurtful things and they're saying like oh well you can't say this but I can say this and not really knowing the balance of what free speech even means so I always tell people free speech is free speech take it or leave it you don't get to censor people <laughs> and tell them what they can and cannot say it's just not how it's not how free speech works, and that's not true liberty. So that's what I really try to promote. As, as you're describing this, I'm also recognizing a terrible fault of my own, which I've been working on to overcome for some time now. But there was a time where if someone was wrong on the Internet, I felt like it was my duty, you know, to, to set them mm. straight. And it never changed minds. It just brought more contention, more anger to the table. What's your recommendation for people who, um, outside of a code of conduct, just in their own, you know, personal conduct would like to have those meaningful conversations without getting caught up in the emotion and that need to be right. Absolutely. I think it starts with first acknowledging um, and understanding to your own personal perspective and view. There were many people giving their their um, opinions on what's happening in Israel with not even really understanding what the heck is even going on over there. So I think first it's important to really break down the information, uh, internalize it for yourself. And then if you have some things maybe you disagree or you agree with and you're having an open discourse, that's why, you know, 
know, in my article, I also pointed out that we need more of those open discourse, being able to pick each other's brains. And I think that's how we can get to some kind of common ground and solutions. Like I said, I'm not saying everyone needs to 100% agree with one another, one another, but for the simple fact of us just being able to have the open dialogue, um, to be able to, to challenge each other's political thought. I, I, I used to think that the reasons the universities existed in the first place was to be able to, you know, meet people from all different parts of the world there. They have diverse perspectives. They have diverse opinions. So being able to kind of challenge them, if I have something else that's different from them, um, I think that's what really sets the tone for having uh, the, the free world that we are looking forward to in that intellectual freedom. So, you know, universities could really be doing a, a better job with uh, creating that sense of community and letting students know that, you know, yes, this is a this is an educational institution. You're here to research. You're here to come up with your own political thought um, and, and be able to debate that or, or discuss that in whatever way you shall. But that's the role that I think that a lot of these educational institutions should, should play. And um, they've definitely come a long way since that. So hoping to see that more. Again, we are talking with Shakira Jackson. She is a Young Voices contributor and an advocate for liberty. Shakira, where can people find you on social media? Yes, you can find me at my tag at Shakira Jackson on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. And that's Shakira Jackson spelled S-H-A-K-I-R-A-J-A-C-K-S-0-N because I like to say I'm not number one, but I'm always on. (laughs) Welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. Hey, we're happy to welcome Joseph Bouchard back to the program. Checking in from what was the Great White North, still Great White uh, North, or uh, are there hints of springtime yet? Well, funny enough, there hasn't been snow in a few weeks, so I guess it's uh, Great Windy North. Okay, <laughs> I can relate. Actually, it's good to catch up with you once again. I enjoyed our last conversation. For, for folks who are meeting you for the first time, could you take just a moment to introduce yourself? Likewise, uh, thanks, Rand, for having me on. So I, I'm a analyst and journalist and a researcher on Latin American issues, especially around security and mining. I'm originally from Canada, which is why I've covered uh, Canadian issues as well. And I'm looking at your article here in, uh, I guess, this is this the, uh, the, the think tank that you work for, McDonald Laurier? Am I saying that correctly? McDonald Laurier Institute, yeah. Okay. That's right. I... I don't think a lot about mining because I'm just not around mining, but uh, this was fascinating to learn that uh, Canadian miners are, are kind of falling behind in terms of, uh, you know, their, their, their uh, production as well as, you know, the, the capital to, to invest and to create even more mines. Talk to us a little bit about the state of mining in the world. Who are the leaders and who are the ones mm. that, uh, that are, are lagging at this point? Well, I would say, first of all, it's it's normal that you don't pay attention that much because most people don't, to be honest. It's it's quite an important field, and most of our most of our well being is thanks to mining and energy production. But most people don't really interact with it, so that's normal. In terms of the the largest producers, well, things have changed quite a bit. It used to be the colonial powers, especially Canada and the United States, that were leaders in mining, especially in the Western Hemisphere. But more and more, China has become the leader, and now uh, is the goal leader in 29 out of 30 of the critical minerals that are important to day-to-day life and future industries and economic growth in many ways. And so China has been a really good uh, actor in terms of how fast it's come up since really 2013 and become the global leader in mining. And one of the things, maybe maybe I should backtrack just a little bit. You mentioned, you know, a lot of us don't think of it because, you know, we enjoy the products that are made from the raw materials that are mined. But uh, when we talk about those raw materials, what are some of the most sought after things that are being mined in the world today? Well, we usually refer to them as critical minerals. It includes things like zinc, copper, gold, nickel, lithium. And it's really the mining sectors that are most present in in the goods that we use so for example lithium is is used in electric vehicles and a lot of technological uh high-tech equipment uh copper is used in a lot of different types of metals and, and and wiring that's very important for electric cables for example and so these critical minerals are really important to pay attention to and and who controls it really controls a lot of the supply chains for many 
goods that we use today. Now, you mentioned that China has been very aggressive in, in terms of uh, their development and uh, and basically, you know, creating mines throughout, uh, I, I would assume, not just in China, but but around the world. Why why did they step up their efforts a decade ago? Well, it, it really came with the arrival of Xi Jinping, the new chairman or president of China, that's uh, taken a more internationalist vision for China's interests. It used to be with Deng Xiaoping and other chairmen uh, that China was a bit more domestic focused and much more liberal and, and open to liberalization. But Xi Jinping's really put a dent in that and uh, put a lot of focus on nationalism and pushing for Chinese interests around the world. And that includes mining, which is, uh, along with energy, some of the most important work that could be done. And China has some of the biggest mines in the world domestically, uh, but it's also taken over the investment sector. It's the largest investor in mining now. And a lot of the times it'll buy successful mines in developing countries like in Africa and Latin America mostly and sort of do a, a sort of a covert, I guess you could say, uh, takeover of Canadian or American or Dutch or Brazilian or British companies that were already operating the mine and already legitimate and and had already set up their operations in a way that was sort of uh, successful and just taking over those mines through sheer amount of investment. And mining at the moment is not a particularly popular field, especially uh, given the state of the environment and, and the rhetoric around environment and policy towards uh, affecting climate change. And so China has been really sort of taking advantage of this gap and provided the field with billions and billions of dollars in investment. So that, that actually leads to my next question. Canada was at one time, you know, up there near the top of as far as the leading uh, forces in, in mining, but, but they've since dropped. I think, I think you mentioned they're still within the top 10, but, but they've dropped a bunch. Is it the environmental concerns that, that have, have throttled back that development or are, are there other factors at work? Well, it's a bit of two things. The first is that Canada, through wanting to meet its climate goals, as well as uh, other financial objectives, has really made it difficult for people to invest in mining, including Canada, whether from domestic or international investors, including American investors, through uh, th things like the Investment Canada Act. And as a result, the mining sector has been really starved out for capital. And uh, China, on the other hand, has all the capital that it needs. Its uh, enterprises are backed by the state and so has basically endless amounts of money and has really taken advantage of this. And they've signed uh, the Foreign Investment uh, Promotion Act uh, with, with Canada recently as well to sort of promote Chinese mining investment, even though the Canadian government says that it wants to decouple from China, especially on critical minerals, and has taken a few steps to, to make that happen, like by adding a national security component to, to critical mineral investment. But it really, because of China's position and the fact that no one else is able to or willing to invest in Canada, given our environmental and financial standards, it seems like um, it's really only left one possibility, which is that China is is the only one able to to invest here that surprises me at, at least from the standpoint i mean not that china wouldn't want to take advantage of a good opportunity but uh, i would think that canada would be able to find um partners a little closer to home that would be willing to to provide that capital and, and help with development is, is there a problem who, who would those most likely partners be and 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 what seems to hold them back well, the most likely is the United States, obviously, uh, unfortunately. And there seems to be a lot of interest in the U.S. to invest in Canada, especially given the fact that we have some of the largest critical mineral reserves in the world. But as I mentioned, uh, in the spirit of fighting climate change and uh, making investment more difficult or competitive, this kind of government re regulations made it very difficult for smaller companies or startup companies in the U.S. to invest, which then only leaves room for the big players uh, like China to, to, to take advantage of that gap, unfortunately.
Now, you mentioned that Canada has taken, a, at least there's a couple of, of pieces of public policy that they've made to, to try to, to help this. Ha, have they made a difference? Somewhat. Uh, we saw the, the Minister of Natural Resources recently talking about the need to decouple and, and uh, asking certain companies to divest their Chinese investment. But uh, no concrete steps have been taken yet. Um, it's mostly rhetorical so far. But there's a lot more public demand for this. And that's why I, I wrote this article as well. Uh, China's become an increasingly important issue in Canada, Chinese interference. Uh, there's a report supposed to come up soon about Chinese interference in Canadian elections, for example, as well as Canadian society as a whole, including the mining sector. And so because of this political pressure, we might see more measures. But uh, for that to happen, there needs to be pressure. And uh, so far, there has been limited amount. Um, but with the upcoming election, that might change. We have about one minute left here, Joseph, but but I have to ask you, what are some of the, the policy um, what are some of the, the policy changes that uh, or alternatives that Canada could try but hasn't yet tried? I think just giving tax and financial incentives for smaller companies, whether from Canada, US or allied countries to invest in Canada and Canadian mining would be a good start. Uh, making the environmental standard process and financial standard process for investment in Canada much simpler would also be a, a great way to start. Uh, the point is we have to incentivize companies to invest here, and that's not what we're doing. And for people who want to become better informed on this issue, myself included, what are some of the resources we might turn to or some of the places we could go for good, solid information? Besides your writing, sure. of course. Well, uh, I write quite often for the McDonald laurie Institute. They have a great program on energy and natural resources. I would highly recommend it. And if you want to follow some of my writing, you can follow me on Twitter at GeoPaulWong. Okay. I'll tell you what. This, I, I told you off the air before we, we did the interview. I, I just saw you know earlier today a, a video of a massive mine collapse in China. Other than that, I haven't really thought much about mining, but now you got my mind on it. I, I inquiring minds like mine want to know i'm going to dig deeper into this joseph thanks again for your time i hope we talk again soon thank you and likewise hope you have a great day Once again, welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. This is our fourth and final segment today. Hey, I'm happy to welcome Jordan McGillis aboard. He is a Young Voices contributor as well as the economics editor of City Journal. Uh, welcome, Jordan. Good to talk with you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. So I've given just a very brief introduction. Could you take just a moment and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. I, as you said, am the economics editor of City Journal. That is the magazine published by the Manhattan Institute. Uh, and we are a free market think tank based in New York, but we, we comment broadly on issues across the U.S. I happen to live in California, uh, and that's made possible, of course, by the Internet. And that's what we're here to talk about today is um, Internet regulation in California. Yeah, set the stage for us, if you would. I'm looking at your article here in the Orange County Register. Proposed California digital accessibility law would halt startups in the Golden State. What's the thinking behind this digital accessibility law? Okay, the basics of the law are that uh, formerly um, voluntary guidelines to make websites more accessible to visually impaired people are now going to become legal requirements uh, for businesses operating in California. So what this would um, in effect require is that any website um, or app utilizes a certain set of standards um, called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines for the visually impaired at risk of uh, being facing civil lawsuits in the state of California. Um, so certain, certain forms of uh, these accessibility guidelines make a ton of sense. Um, businesses want to have as many customers as possible. Getting informed about what can make your website or your app more useful to uh, a wider population is something that many businesses would like to understand. Um, but when you open up small businesses to lawsuits, if they don't comply with some very technical standards, you're, what you're inevitably doing is shutting down creativity, shutting down uh, productivity 
in a state that, of course, is famous for its um, ability to launch internet companies. So it's cutting off um, one of the lifebloods of the of the state. Yeah, something you point out in the article is just how many of these digital startups begin in California. And I think, well, you know, come to think of it, Silicon Valley, that's, uh, that kind of was, was the epicenter where, where a lot of uh, how the world runs today was developed. Of course, the, the hardware um, revolution that started in Silicon Valley with the launch of, uh, you know, the silicon um, industry and, and the semiconductor industry uh, took place. But in recent decades, California has pivoted um, due to the nature of the global market away from hardware and more toward things like apps and, and online businesses. A couple that uh, everyone will know about are like PayPal, Google. And then what I talked about in this article in the Orange County Register is Airbnb. Now, it's a bit of a polarizing company, but it is absolutely a phenomenal success story. And the way it got off the ground um, is really quite fascinating. It was two roommates. Uh, they were web designers themselves, li- lived in San Francisco, but they were a bit bit hard up and they needed to make a little bit extra cash to, to pay their rent. And one roommate emailed the other and said, hey, I have an idea. There's a conference in town this weekend. Why don't we put up a website and rent out our apartment as a mini Airbnb? We can roll out some cots. We can make a couple of eggs in the morning and hopefully we, we make a few bucks as a result and can pay rent. Uh, they did that. And a couple of people, believe it or not, found the website and stayed that weekend for the conference. Um, The next year, that company got into a startup accelerator, Y Combinator, and the rest is history. It's now one of the most successful and disruptive companies uh, in the the digital era. Um, They've completely changed how we think about accommodations when we travel now. And Airbnb got its start when two guys had an idea and were able to get it online quickly. Now, if they face the sort of uh, legal liability that AB 1757 would put on small businesses, they may not have had the confidence uh, to make that launch. And it isn't probably the case that every single business that doesn't comply with this um, bill, if it becomes law, will get sued, but any business could be sued. And so it raises the the cost of entry. And what it would do is entrench the incumbents. The companies I mentioned, PayPal, Google, Airbnb, They have billions of dollars to work with. They can hire legal teams to ensure they're compliant. But two roommates who want to get off, get their business off the ground, they wouldn't have the resources to make sure they're in line with this law and to protect them from the legal liability. There's a word you used that I wish was on more people's lips, and that is the word disruptive. Because there was a time, well, that's disruptive behavior. You go stand in the corner. But when it comes to improving our lives, disruptive disruptive moves in the economy actually make things much better. Anybody who's ever ridden with Lyft or Uber, rather than having to, you know, try to flag a taxi, can understand that that was disruptive when it arrived on the scene. And I know there were people who wanted to put up barriers to prevent them from coming in, primarily the taxi companies, you know. How how can they operate and why shouldn't they be paying the same thing that we're paying? And and yet they were there doing are, doing a better a job. Lot of, a lot of overlaps here. And uh, I've written quite a bit about autonomous vehicles in addition to this Um, digital accessibility requirement in California. And there is a uh, significant constituency in this state that wants to prevent autonomous trucks from being able to operate. This is paradoxical because California is the home of most of the technology companies that are going to make the autonomous driving revolution possible. But here in this state, it may not be able to get off the ground. The Teamsters led uh, a legislative Um, coalition effectively in 2023 that put a bill in front of Governor Gavin Newsom that would have blocked autonomous trucks from operating in the state um, unless they had a driver in the seat. Think about that. They're not going to let the (laughs) autonomous trucks operate, but if they have a driver in the seat, they can. It it makes no sense. Fortunately, Governor Gavin Newsom, for all his his faults, uh, he was right on this one. He vetoed that bill. Um, But that's the sort of thing we're seeing increasingly in California where incumbents, such as the teams, such as uh, in the, the Airbnb case, it could have been hotel um, companies. They want to stop that disruption, that creative destruction that makes all of us better off by giving us more options, by lowering prices, and by making our lives easier and, and more affordable in the end. I, I think you have made one of the best cases ever for why those little, those small startup companies with with disruptive ideas 
need to have their chance. And that doesn't mean government needs to support them, but they, they need to be able to enter into the market and either rise or fail based on the merits of their idea. Airbnb was a great example of that. Um, I'm staying at an Airbnb this weekend for that matter. And, and thank goodness for that, because sometimes a hotel just isn't really the, the kind of fit that I'm looking for. Back to the, to the digital accessibility, I want to stress that the guidelines themselves are not a problem. The guidelines are very helpful. And uh, when you are starting a business, as I mentioned, you want to expand your market and bringing more users onto your platform by making it accessible to visually impaired is a good idea, but it's a cost that not all small businesses can necessarily cover right off the bat. Um, and so the issue here is not the guidelines themselves. Uh, it is the fact that we are making businesses um, legally vulnerable if they're unable as they get started to meet those requirements. Yeah, that's a powerful disincentive to to risk sticking your neck out and, and trying to, to you know grow that idea into something viable. Um, who are the who are the primary people who are um, pushing back against this this digital accessibility law? I think there's a significant uh, contingent within the tech industry, but I haven't seen too much public commentary. I think among the major California papers, um, my op-ed in the Orange County Register is the first that I've seen that is bringing this to light. The California legislature deals with a lot of uh, different bills, and we don't know where this is going to go. It may not ultimately um, come into law, and let's let's hope it doesn't. Um, but the people who are ultimately harmed by this sort of idea, if it does become law, are just average citizens like you and me who are denied the opportunity to, to utilize something that could be a great idea. It could be the next Airbnb. We don't know what businesses are going to be prevented from coming into fruition by something like this, uh, but we want to make sure that um, those liabilities aren't stopping creativity in this otherwise amazing state. Yeah. No, I, I think you, you make a beautiful case for, look, some of these companies may not have as much access as others. And, and I'm, I'm curious, the one size fits all approach, um, does it really work? I mean, is, is it really the, the panacea that, uh, that some people seem to think it might be? I'll tell you who it works for. It works for powerful incumbents. Then this is something in uh, the the free market world we talk about a lot. There is often a coalition built between what we would call the Baptists, who are the morally righteous, uh, in this case, those who want to help the visually impaired, and the bootleggers, in this case, those are the, the companies that would benefit from this prohibition. So in this case, the large uh, the large online presences, they would benefit from a prohibition that is based on um, a sense of moral righteousness that is really misplaced. I'm, I'm with you on that. So give, the, give those ideas a chance to succeed. And um, tell me this, uh, Jordan, where can people find you on social media? Where can they follow your work? On the website formerly known as Twitter, I am at Jordan McGillis. Uh, and again, I'm the economics editor of City Journal. You can find that online cityjournal.com or uh, manhattan.institute. Very good. Jordan, it was great to visit with you. I look forward to our next conversation. Thanks, Brian.